right, good evening. Uh, it's 7.01, so we'll go ahead and get started with tonight's fireside. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, thermal neck fractures in younger patients. And this is the beginning of a, a series of going through different difficult fracture problems. Uh, and so these will have, be happening on Tuesdays. Be sure to look out for the upcoming uh, topics and we'll have those listed at the end as well as with the specific dates. I'm Brett Chris. I'll be the moderator for this session. And the other faculty members are Mitch Bernstein and uh, John Scalaro. And so these are our disclosures, none of which are specifically relevant to this topic. This is our agenda. We have 90 minutes and we'll be going through um, just this short introduction, a couple of cases with opportunities to ask questions um, over the case specifically or just topics in general, but we will be going over uh, Dr. Scalaro's uh, biomechanics paper that was published in JOT in 2020. And then we'll wrap it up with final questions and discussion. And so we do have a Q&A function. And so if you could please, there's just a lot of folks registered, over 700 uh, participants have registered. So we won't be able to take uh, your, you know, unmute you and ask you, have you ask your question. So we have the Q&A section. And so please type your questions into that. And then we'll save um, questions that seem uh, relevant to everybody to answer live. And if we can answer by typing or if there's way too many questions, we'll, we'll type the answers in as well. So please feel free to ask any question that you have. If it's a topic that we'll be addressing a little bit later, we'll wait to address it. And then we'll uh, wrap up at the end with a uh, summary and uh, show how you can uh, get access to the recording later. So the learning objectives for this fireside is to recognize indications for closed and open reduction uh, of femoral neck fractures, describe the preoperative and intraoperative logistics needed for surgical execution, describe the key steps for an anterior or Smith-Peterson type approach to the hip for ORIF of a femoral neck fracture, and utilize closed and open reduction techniques. And then we'll summarize some of the biomechanical differences for femoral neck fracture fixation in young patients, as well as how it relates to specific fracture patterns. And so young femoral neck fractures, there's, there's a bit of a debate, like what age is a cutoff? Is it 60? Is it 55? If it's, if it, is it less than 50? Uh, based on some studies, people with medical comorbidities, maybe total uh, hip arthroplasty candidates, even younger than 50, based on a study out of the Carolinas Medical Center. Um, but I think most people would probably qualify patients 55 or younger who, who do not have uh, pre-existing arthritis. And so this is a 28-year-old uh, who sustained this femoral neck fracture that will kind of wrap up at the end with. Uh, so timing of surgery is always a controversial or debated topic in young patients uh, to potentially uh, salvage the blood supply to the femoral head, and um, are these surgical emergencies? Um, there's been several articles that have looked at this over the years, but they are young patients. We want to try to preserve their hip, and they're not great arthroplasty candidates, especially like that 28-year-old. It would be not great if he was 28 and just got a total hip out of the gate. And so are they surgical emergencies? We'll just briefly touch on this. The current best evidence, and some of those studies are listed uh, in the box there, um, they don't disprove, disprove an association between surgical time interval and the rate of AVN or non-union, which are the complications that we're trying to avoid. But most of the evidence is level four, and there's really only one level one prospective randomized trial out of India, and that's the one that's highlighted in yellow, which uh, showed no difference in AVN or non-union rate uh, when it just comes down to timing. But the things that have been shown in multiple papers is that injury factors that you can't control, uh, can't control like initial displacement and posture comminution uh, lead to poor outcomes, but technical factors like poor reduction, those are the things that have repeatedly shown uh, poor outcomes. And so this is a, a case example that was referred to, to our center. This is a 25 year old who underwent closed reduction and sliding hip screw placement with an anti-rotation screw on the AP view looks pretty good, but these are difficult reductions and this um, axial plane reduction can be very difficult. And you can see by the outline of the head that um, the lag bolt actually went in, out, in. And so this 
puts the uh, femoral head at significant risk for AVN in addition to the original injury. And so in, in summary, we don't want people to rush to do these in the middle of the night if you're not gonna do your best job because really the controllable factor is the reduction. And so we need to make sure that you're gonna do the best reduction that you can by whatever means that is. And so poor reduction has reliably led to poor outcomes. And so that's why we're gonna focus on uh, reduction techniques for this uh, fireside. So when to do it closed. Uh, John Scalaro is gonna present a case uh, to go over those exact reasons and indications. So I'm gonna stop sharing and let John share his screen. Great, thanks Brett. Appreciate the introduction. And so I'm gonna start off here with a case and I do have a couple um, interactive question. So please participate. I think that will help guide some of the discussion uh, moving forward. And so this is a 26 year old male who presented to our institution uh, following a ballistic injury to the right hip. And here is presenting radiographs at the time of intake in the trauma bay. And so you can see the ballistic material uh, in and around the femoral neck on the right side, the external rotation of the uh, femoral shaft and the displaced femoral neck fracture, uh, which is seen. And so patient uh, gets a CT scan uh, during their, their workup and we were able to obtain some uh, 3D surface rendered images of this uh, injury. And so you can see some of the ballistic material, which is uh, present in and around the inferior aspect of the femoral neck. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of this uh, inferior and posterior inferior comminution, uh, which is which are present in a lot of these injuries, uh, but especially following this uh, injury and this lesion here, you can see that that's definitely present. I think it's also worth noting some of the serrations uh, of the fracture line, but this does have the vertically oriented um, morphology that a lot of these high energy uh, injuries have. And so uh, despite the fact that this was a ballistic uh, injury, it does have that vertically oriented nature, which places a lot of, of shear forces across the fracture once uh, fixation is, is placed. And so I think to complete this story, it gets a little bit more complicated. And so uh, this patient did have vascular injuries. And so uh, he was taken to the operating room for exploratory laparotomy. Um, he had repaired to uh, the femoral arteries on the right side. Uh, the repair itself was complicated by a lot of uh, blood loss, 40 units over the course of um, approximately the first 24 or so hours. He developed a large hematoma in his right groin around one of his anastomoses and returned back to the operating room uh, at day one. At day zero is impossible to really do anything for him. So day one, he goes back to the operating room once he's a little bit more stable for uh, re-exploration of uh, the laparotomy. Uh, he was having some issues with rather myelitis. Um, and so the general surgeons and vascular surgeons at that point, knowing that we were kind of on them, for potentially intervening uh, for this patient, you know, for his femoral neck fracture, which was not, you know, uh, critical at this point, said, you know, if you can do, if you want to do something, you can do it at the end of, of our OR session. So we'll put the first question up uh, for polling. And so at this point, uh, based on what you saw and this clinical situation and knowing that you could do something, um, what would you proceed with? An ORIF um, waiting at this point letting you know, things settle down and then going back for ORIF, um, proceeding with a closed uh, reduction, an attempted closed reduction and provisional fixation, or, or just nothing, chalking this up to the fact that this patient's gonna uh, need a total hip at some point. So why don't we open polling and go from there. All right, no, so a good mix of answers. Um, seems like the majority of folks either want to wait and proceed uh, with ORF once the patient is a little bit more stable or attempt a close reduction and uh, some sort of fixation. So this is what we did. And so uh, this is a patient uh, who was in the operating room just in the supine position. And so um, we placed traction on the lower extremity and uh, attempted a closed reduction. And so 
close reduction maneuver here was simply traction and internal rotation. And the key here is not something that I do extremely commonly, uh, but place a guide wire for a cannulated screw uh, into the intact lateral cortex of the proximal femur and get it to a point where it's just about to cross the fracture. And then once I have an adequate or appropriate reduction, uh, advance the guide wire across the, uh, the fracture. Uh, not in this situation, but in most situations, I'll have multiple guide wires ready, uh, usually two guide wires uh, ready and in, in through the lateral cortex and ready to kind of cross the fracture once I have an appropriate uh, reduction. And so we did that uh, in this case and passed our guide wires. And again, in a more controlled situation, I think my guide wire placement on the lateral view specifically would have been um, optimize a little bit more, but uh, given the positioning of the patient and kind of the situation that we were working in, this is what we had. I thought I uh, liked the read that I had fluoroscopically, and so uh, advanced the guide wires, and then first placed a partially threaded cannulated screw in the cranial position to um, uh, pull what I thought the, you know, the head and neck was uh, into a little bit more of a valgus uh, position, then placed a fully threaded screw in the inferior caudal position. Uh, afterwards. And my thought process here was that um, if this is, if, it, if this at least stabilized the proximal femur, then the blood supply uh, would not be at risk for further uh, uh, kinking or displacement or disruption as the patient continued to be moved around. Uh, and I could always revise this if I needed to at a later time point. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't, you know, if I did happen to like it, then I could potentially, you know, think about readdressing it uh, at a later time point. And so this is what we got. And uh, these were the final radiographs. You can see the, the x flap uh, staple line, the midline, and the two groin staple lines from the vascular surgeons. And so uh, we had this lateral view that was obtained. And then a CT scan was obtained uh, as well and showed us these uh, this reduction. And so this is an axial cut, a selected uh, coronal CT cut, as well as the 3D rendered uh, CT cut. And so uh, we were actually pretty happy with this. Uh, again, not optimal screw position, um, but a nice reduction. So at this point, I'm going to open up the questions again, and let's just see what um, folks would want to do. Given this reduction and given this uh, fixation, uh, what would you do now? And the uh, you know, options are one, nothing, just leave it alone. The reduction and fixation are sufficient. Uh, return back to the operating room, place a cannulated screw uh, or screws, return to the operating room for a change of implants, uh, potentially or return to the OR for something else, some different uh, uh, fixation device or, uh, or surgical procedure. Good. So it looks like most of the people who responded like this reduction, uh, as well as the fixation. Uh, a few people wanted to go back and uh, add another screw and then a little smattering of uh, the remainder. And so I'll show you what we did here. And so, again, this is a, about three days later. The patient was much more stable at that time point. Uh, the reduction and fixation appeared unchanged based on uh, what we'd obtained previously. But looking at the CT scan and looking at our radiographs, we had an opportunity for uh, another screw. I wanted to place this kind of off axis from the other screws which were placed. I really liked what I had had, so I didn't want to uh, change that. And so uh, proceeded with placement of one more screw, a little bit. Hey, John, John, sorry to interrupt. The, for some reason, it's your slide stuck on the oh. initial post-op image with the two screws. Okay. You can try to escape and then pull it up again, or just, yeah, that's probably gonna be the best. Okay, sorry. Are you seeing this now with the CT scan? Not yet. Sorry, give me one second. You're seeing it on your end, yeah. yeah. 
nothing, no change. It just no, it, it yeah. looks like it's starting. It's trying to pull up your screen, but it's not. I mean, you might have to log off and log back on. Right. I apologize. Greg, can you call an audible here and uh, yep. take over? All right. I'll be back. Yep. Now. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. So the it won't take too long. So the there were a couple of questions while he's um yeah, Gerard, that's a great point. Switch screens. Uh, we'll have them definitely try that. But there are a couple questions about the like screw configuration. Um, and so the the first question is why only two screws? And although a screen wasn't advancing, the uh, initial reason was because the patient wasn't uh, stable. Did they feel like it was stable enough to proceed with um, the definitive fixation? So it's kind of initial provisional slash resuscitation type uh fixation and then um i think that may also ans answer the other question about the positional screw inferiorly um it's typically just to try to maintain the area where the comminution is to try to maintain length um there you go all right i apologize i'm gonna so this is the image that we last left at It was the AP pelvis. Right there. Yep, that one. Okay. All right, so I apologize. So this is this is the initial post-op lateral. And then this was the um, the CT that we had obtained that showed our uh, that showed our reduction. And so we had I'd run the polling question following this. It seemed like most people were pretty happy with the um, with the reduction. And just in the interest of time, I apologize again. Um, brought the patient back to the operating room and had an opportunity for uh, one more off axis screw uh, in a different position. And so it was able to place a, um, a third screw directed more uh, anterior to posterior along the posterior aspect of the, uh, of the femoral neck. And again, you see the comminution. And then here's our post-op view, uh, post-op AP hip, as well as uh, UCI lateral. Uh, of the uh, of the patient's proximal femur, you can see the inferior comminution uh, near the neck. Most of the inferior neck was uh, gone, especially near the uh, lesser trochanter. So a significant amount of comminution. Uh, we had an opportunity for another CT scan. Uh, following this, again, just checking the uh, the reduction in the axial and uh, coronal planes, which we were quite happy with. Then this is the patient at uh, two months follow up. Um, started letting them uh, weight bear shortly thereafter. Already showed some healing in the inferior aspect of the neck in the extracapsular uh, region. The lateral view here as well, again, uh, suboptimal. And then I last saw this patient at six months. And so um, this was a closed reduction in internal fixation for a comminuted femoral neck fracture in a patient who uh, was physiologically not ready for a uh, large operation and in addition had, uh, you know, a previous anterior surgical approach by the vascular surgeons um, for vascular repair that I didn't, was not enthusiastic about going through for, uh, for an open reduction. And these are the, the final uh, lateral radiographs as well. So in summary, and I, again, I apologize for my, my internet difficulties. Um, I think there is a role for closed reduction internal fixation. Some of this is based on the clinical scenario in which you're you're dealing with for a patient, especially who may be an extremist or in a uh, in a compromised situation where you know it's really life over over limb. While a total hip may be suboptimal for a 20 year old, um, if the patient's not around to enjoy their lower extremity or their hip, then uh, then that's going to be a problem. I think there is something to be said about the fracture pattern, and uh, and this is twofold really on either end of the spectrum. One, I had the benefit of of a lot of uh, nice serrated edges on this fracture, which were able to be uh, keyed in. So I had some inherent stability to the fracture pattern, uh, which was able to be maximized. And you saw, even though that there was uh, a lot of inferior comminution, I, I think the fracture pattern worked to my advantage, at least uh, outside of the area of the ballistic injury. Uh, some people have uh, talked about the fact that in a significantly comminuted uh, fractures where there may not be a a read with an open reduction, that closed reduction and internal fixation has a role. And I, again, like a lot of other uh, fractures that we deal with in the, in the you know, especially in the tibia or elsewhere, um, I think timing has, has a 
a fat or his timing is a factor here as well. We were able to get to this pretty early and before a lot of uh, deformity and uh, fracture hematoma had you know, been able to gather, we were able to uh, provide some stability and, and obtain this reduction. I think the technique we went through briefly, having wires in the lateral uh, aspect of the proximal femur and then advancing them as soon as you obtain your reduction. Uh, imaging, uh, be careful of fluoroscopic uh, imaging because I think it can lie. I have had the experience of attempting a, a closed reduction and then subsequently opening it and realizing that my read and my reduction uh, was not as good uh, under direct visualization as it was uh, based on fluoroscopy. I think there are some advanced imaging modalities that uh, can be beneficial here. Uh, some centers have these intraoperative uh, imaging machines that can provide you almost real-time uh, advanced imaging, almost CT-like uh, for these injuries. But ultimately, reduction is, is key. Any implant that you place, and we'll get into some of the discussion about implants, uh, is compromised when you have a, a poor suboptimal reduction. So uh, thank you, and I will stop sharing at this point. Thanks, John. So there are um, a fair number of uh, audience questions. And so I would kind of summarize them in, uh, there's questions on, and I know we'll get into the little bit of the biomechanics later, but can you talk about um, in that case, uh, why I think I mentioned a little bit why you may have done two screws initially, but um, there's questions about, you know, why use um, fully threaded screws uh, when you went back as well. And then I think, um, why, don't, why don't we talk about that? Like, when do you use partially threaded versus fully threaded screws just in general? So in general, if I have surfaces that are able to be com compressed, clean fracture lines, uh, then I'll use a partially threaded screw. In that situation, if you remember the fracture pattern itself, the anterior and cranial aspect of that fracture um, had nice serrated edges that I thought I was able to key in nicely. In addition, the more, the more cranial screw, uh, like I said, allowed me to, what I believe, pull that fracture into a, a, just a touch more valgus than I had with just traction alone. The fully threaded screw I'll place when there's, uh, when there's comminution. And so uh, the inferior screw in that case was uh, fully threaded. And then that's the last screw that I placed when I went back, again, went along that while it was more uh, along the, the midpoint of the femoral neck, it was uh, going posteriorly where I knew there was comminution from the ballistic injury. So uh, primarily just based on, on fracture pattern. If I have a, uh, a fracture that has, that has nice clean edges, uh, they all, you know, fractures like compression. So I don't uh, like to uh, utilize fully threaded screws when there's not uh, comminution present. In general, that's, that's just a general answer for uh, for, um, uh, for my technique. And then um, the other thing would be uh, like, do you think screw size matters? Like, are you like putting a larger screw inferiorly, or does it matter what what diameter? No, I think in general, most people have at their hospital uh, anything between six point five and eight millimeter cannulated screws, and I think. Uh, any of those are uh, are just fine. I don't I don't think there's much you know. I personally don't think there's any evidence to support you know seven or eight point oh millimeter over seven point three millimeter or, or seven point five or, or, or similar. A lot of it has to do honestly with the real estate in the femoral neck. Some patients just have more real estate in their femoral neck and can tolerate larger screws. Other other patients you know uh, maybe smaller individuals uh, may not have a neck that will accommodate large, uh, large screws. And I think we, we run into that issue sometimes with some of these newer implants that, that come out and, and trying to make sure we optimize their placement uh, uh, in patients who have a smaller, smaller anatomy. Um, and and uh, Mitch, feel free to jump in as well. But the, um, what about like when you're doing a closed reduction, do you find there's any benefit and not necessarily just in this case, because you'd mentioned about the vascular repair, but in somebody who has uh, gets a closed reduction that doesn't have this type of ballistic type injury or um, you know something that's out of the ordinary say it's just a regular closed femoral neck fracture that you're going to try to close reduce like do you find that there's a benefit for an arthrotomy to release the intercapsular pressure 
you know, I, I know the literature uh, behind it. I have not routinely gone and, you know, slid a, you know, a 15 blade on a long handle or, or something similar uh, along the, uh, along the neck to relieve the, the capsular pressure. That has not been routine practice uh, for me. Uh, and I'd be interested to hear your, your all's thoughts on that. But I, like I said, I think there is a, this is not something, you know, in full disclosure, this is not something that I'm, I'm doing all the time. Uh, I'd be interested to see over the coming years as we get better evidence with regard to uh, practice, uh, a more defined role for uh, close reduction in these, in these injuries. I think this is a really good question. And then um, the other thing, which I think is really important, can you just verify what you use as your um, like parameters for an acceptable close reduction and not just in this case, but in general? What would you say is the things that should um, like radiographically uh, qualify as an adequate or a good close reduction to where you can uh, apply fixation? Yeah, I think it's, uh, if I have a reduction in which I can look at, you know, Shenton's line of, you know, coming across from the, uh, the obturator frame and the pelvis along the inferior aspect of the neck, as long as I don't have uh, a significant step off and I, you know, I don't have a great definition for what's significant, but if I don't have a, a market step off or along the inferior aspect of the neck, and then on multiple oblique views, including a good lateral radiograph, if I don't have translation or uh, uh, step up, you know, the, the common deformities, right, are uh, shortening and apex anterior deformity or translation on the lateral view. And those all have to be non-existent for me to be happy with a close reduction. Mitch, do you have any other thoughts about it or any, any parameters? I thought, you I thought you'd never ask me, Brett, to be honest. I thought you'd never ask me. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm gonna talk about it in my, in my case. But I'm um, I, I also for full disclosure, I don't really have a lot of experience with close reduction for displaced young femoral necks. Um, you know, obtaining the reduction initially, if it looks good, I'm always a little anxious on on is it going to look good at the end of uh, the case when the screws are put in. Yeah. So the, uh, I mean, I think the, if you really look into the literature that's been published, at least uh, maybe not in the last year or two, but like the main studies that people have referred to for several years, a lot of the reductions are done closed. Even like the Swinkowski paper, if you really look at it, like a lot of those uh, fractures were reduced closed. And so I think um, we do have to kind of admit that, like one of my one of my friends calls it orthopedics dirty little secret. Um, but like, you know, closed reductions are done routinely. And so we like, I think John said it perfectly, like you need to make the hip look like a hit. So take it just like we do with other things, like take a picture, fluoroscopic image of the other side to know what's normal for that patient and then recreate it on the operative side. And if you're not happy, then you have to be prepared to open it. Um, I think the John's point about the case that he did with, uh, where he did a close reduction and then he ended up opening it to look at it. Um, oftentimes you will find that there's a rot uh, rotational uh, mismatch or rotational malreduction. And so like the, you know, if you do these fairly commonly, um, just try to do it closed uh, and then check it on your open reduction if you end up deciding to do it open or to like understand why it didn't reduce well closed, but you're trying to match the radiographic parameters that John mentioned, like Shenton's line. If you, you, you take it out of varus, you take it out, uh, you get the length back and you avoid apex uh, anterior angulation. Um, the other thing that I forgot to ask about the screws uh, is do you guys, um, when you're doing screw configuration, um, what about parallel versus uh, not parallel or using the um, transverse type screw um, from the greater trochan or like, what are your thoughts about screw pattern? Um, I, I just want to echo what you said, Brett, and I'll answer that. You said the word prepared. I think it's, it's really important that the surgeon is um, able to or prepared to switch to an open reduction after spending potentially some energy on closed reduction techniques. So I, I do agree with that. For screws, 
Um, if it's very vertical, uh, I have done one of those screws from the greater trochanter into the inferior quadrant of the femoral um, of the femoral head. I don't use it routinely though. Yeah, I don't use the I don't use that screw either. There's a I believe it was uh, Max Ashino's paper when uh, through shock that he looked at that as an injury, and I can't quote it 100% um, correctly, but they looked at the use of the Powell screw or that 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 more transversely oriented screw and they didn't uh, see any benefit to it. So I do not use it routinely. Yeah, I think, um, so I, I, if I am gonna use screws, uh, I use it if it's a simple uh, vertical fracture and use it as a lag type screw. Um, and I think that's kind of when it may work the best. I think um, some people put it in as a avoid a varus, not, um, a varus uh, post-operative change like because the screw will kind of hit into the cortex. So it hopefully prevents varus uh, mal or it's not malreduction, but late displacement. Um, and so I think if you use it in the right situation, I think it may be um, uh, helpful if you can actually get some compression uh, perpendicular to the fracture line. Um, the, uh, there are some really good questions. We have a couple minutes before I need to move on. Um, John, you mentioned that uh, about using intraoperative uh, 3D fluoro. Do you get, uh, like in this patient, you got a CT scan, but do you get CT scans routinely in thermal neck fractures in young patients postoperatively? No, I, I use it if I'm going to be, if I need to check something specifically, if I need to judge a reduction or I'm looking for something specifically in this situation, right? The patient was getting multiple CT scans anyway. And so, uh, we just, you know, borrowed some data from uh, the vascular CT scans that were that were getting done. It just, you know, I did ask, is the patient going to get another CT scan? They said, yeah, they're going right back to the scanner. So I said, fantastic. Can you just make sure that you, in, you know, include fine cuts to the femoral neck so that we can uh, take a look? Um, so that's that's routine. If I'm looking at it and I do an open reduction, then there's no re I don't think there's any reason to get a CT scan. Uh, we do now at our center have one of the uh, the fluoroscopic uh, imaging machines that allows us to do kind of a quick uh, quote unquote spin that uh, that will give us some CT like imaging relatively quickly. So I have used that not only in femoral necks but in um, pelvic and acetabular work for uh, similar situations when I need to judge implant placement or judge reduction. And then uh, just the final. Um couple related questions. So if you're going to do a closed reduction, how many attempts do you do before you move on to open? Uh, depends on how many cases I have that day, uh, time of day, uh, patients, a lot of a lot of factors, honestly. Um, but I'm probably no longer than 15, 15 minutes. Because at that point, I'm just if if I continue to pulling the fracture edges and, and manipulating the lower extremity, I may be losing a cortical read that I would have otherwise had available to me uh, with an open approach. And so I don't wanna create nubbins out of a, uh, a nice read that I may, may have in the femoral neck, either you know, cranially or anteriorly. Yeah, I think I think uh, my experience, you'll kind of know the ones that uh, with if, with the initial close reduction attempt, if you feel like you can mi do minor changes to get it right. But some of them will just if they're really um, vertical, like they won't reduce very well with the kind of typical measure. So does anybody have any percutaneously um, applied uh, techniques or tools that they've used for uh, close reduction techniques? Well, I think the, you know, one of the things that we'll use sometimes almost uh, in you know, more intertrochanteric type fractures, a, a shoulder hook along the inferior aspect of the neck or something similar, not a, not a large bone hook, but a, a shoulder hook or similar instrument that will allow you to maybe key in that inferior portion of the neck, uh, I think can be, can be useful as an adjunct to a, a close reduction. Then finally, I think you guys have said before that you primarily do free leg on a radiolucent table. Um, I use a fracture table or uh, if they have to be on a radiolucent table, I have used uh, skeletal traction placed through the distal femur. I think those are all options. Uh, I think you just have to 
use what resources you have available and uh, kind of figure out what works for you. But I think also percutaneously even placing, uh, like say they have a combined femoral neck and femoral shaft and you're trying to do the femoral neck close, like doing a shant screw in the proximal femur can be helpful to control the femoral neck reduction. And you can even do that if there's not a combined injury. That would be a percutaneous option in addition to using uh, safely using a uh, ball spike pusher uh, through a small safely applied anterior incision that you bluntly dissect down to the anterior neck fragment. Uh, you just have to do it using fluoroscopic assistance or using free. There's kind of different tricks that have been used for geriatric uh, intertrope fractures, same, same types of things. But I think if you find yourself, you know, an hour into it and you're still messing with the close reduction, I think it's probably time to convert to an open. But with that, um, we'll kind of move on to the next section. And so we talked a little bit about, you know, when is closed reduction not good enough? So we talked about before, poor reduction is the consistent theme as far as things that don't lead to good outcomes for these fractures. And so you need to get it right. And so the reduction is the thing that you can control along with the fixation to try to maximize their outcomes. Uh, and, you know, use multiple wires, multiple joysticks, whether it's closed versus open. And so Mitch is going to go over indications for open reduction techniques, the logistics in the OR and, you know, just the logistics of doing the procedure and then how to do an open reduction through an anterior uh, approach. So I'll stop and give Mitch the screen. Thank you. Looks good. Looks, looks great. Thanks, Brent. All right, guys. So we're going to move on to um, open reduction techniques. And uh, we will start with a case. Uh, so this is an 18-year-old uh, male who presented um, when I used to work in Chicago. He fell off a balcony. He was at a party. Uh, there was some illicit drug use. So his pain was quite controlled. And he ended up walking quite a bit on his ephemeral neck and uh, presented to our hospital with uh, this displaced femoral neck fracture. <clears throat> and um, the first question I'd ask you to reflect on is, is classification. So um, I know we talked about the Powell's classification during the question and answer, but for me, practically speaking, um, you know, classifying the fracture as it relates to, uh, John talked about these fracture reads, uh, is there comminution? Where is the comminution? What does the calcar look like? Is there going to be a cortical read? So for me, I look at obviously the verticality, the fracture, but also is there interdigitations that can be used uh, for open reduction techniques? And then you want to think about how, how are you going to obtain this reduction? I think closed reductions are, are good. I admittedly don't have a lot of experience with closed reductions just because I'm, I'm okay at obtaining a reduction, but the issue for me is maintaining the reduction until the final implants are in. And that's also what I'd ask you to consider is how you're gonna maintain this reduction. And uh, if so, what strategies would you use? Uh, clamps, uh, traction, uh, or other things to maintain it before the definitive implant go, goes in. The other thing, uh, at least for me, is you know how anxious does this case make uh, make you? Uh, do you have the OR logistics? Do you have the team uh, to do this properly? Uh, how urgent is this case for you? And again, what are your surgical priorities as it relates to a displaced femoral neck fracture? So all this, for me at least, um, uh, I factor in, and I use this um, for this case particularly. So for me, this is a young male. Uh, he has a displaced comminuted uh, femoral neck fracture with posterior neck uh, comminution. And again, you know, um, it's, it's, it's been described that, you know, you want to do this case, especially um, right the first time, because the morbidity, as John Scalaro wrote in his article, the morbidity of uh, one of these cases not doing well is significant for young patients. So my plan is an open reduction internal fixation. 
uh, indications for me for an open approach uh, for young young patients with a displaced femoral neck is again this this a bit obnoxious comment on unable to obtain or maintain an acceptable close reduction. And again, I I treat these fractures um, with the the goal of anatomic reduction, truly anatomic reduction, where the fracture is loaded, assuming there's not circumferential comminution. And then um, surgeon experience obviously takes is, is really important. So keep in mind, again, you'll, you might hear this quote, the reduction is one of the only surgeon controlled variables. I think Brett mentioned this in the introduction. So um, we can't control the patient necessarily how compliant they are, we can't control the, the injury pattern, but we can control the reduction and the reduction does matter. Uh, multiple studies have shown that complications are correlated um, with the ability to obtain a stable anatomic reduction and, and therefore avoiding uh, complications uh, is obviously very important. Uh, Pre-op plan, obviously the bed, uh, we just, just discussed that briefly. Um, I typically use a, a, a flat top uh, OSI type bed. Um, I free leg uh, the patient, I put the patient supine, uh, C-arms coming off from the other side. Uh, I bring in the C-arm at an angle to get a good lateral of the femoral neck as opposed to a true shoot through. I think that just gives me better uh, imaging of the femoral neck. Uh, what implants you're going to use, and then back up adjunct implants, whether you're using a sliding hip screws or a cannulated screws and what sizes. I, I, some other subtle things, I don't know if you realize John Scalero had, uh, which appeared to be a drill tip wire, uh, as opposed to a threaded tip wire, and maybe we can discuss that later, uh, just about adjusting the proper trajectory in the bone is probably a little easier with a drill tip wire than a, than a um, threaded tip wire. And then post-operatively, uh, what, what plan are you going to have for the patient? This is a, a picture from one of my ORs. Um, I use, again, a flat top uh, OSI type bed. Um, I have this uh, pipe bender that's uh, very expensive now <laughs> that uh, simply just uh, has the traction pulled over it. So it's sterilized with a impermeable stockinette. I use this old uh, traction bow with a two millimeter K wire in the distal femur and uh, non-sterily attach 15 to 20 pounds of weight at the end of the bed. And that's how I obtain uh, traction. <clears throat> Other clamps, uh, I, I use these routinely, these uh, modified clamps to get a clamp tine uh, into the, um, into the femoral uh, neck, the, the proximal segment and either a nut, another straight tine into the uh, other side of the femur or around the greater trochanter. And this obtains uh, compression at the anterior and inferior fracture margin and also will reduce um, or restore the, the antiversion of the femoral neck and reduce that apex anterior deformity that I think is really important. So the other uh, comment I'll just say is paralysis. Um, I, I just did a case today where I find sometimes the anesthesiologists don't really appreciate how important it is for paralysis. So paralysis, I think is really, really important. And um, the last time I did one of these cases, the, the patient was not adequately paralyzed and it, it can become very difficult to reduce these fractures. <clears throat> so for this uh, patient, I'm using a 7.3 cannulated screws. So I'm just going to show you some key steps and then we'll go over uh, a video from one of my cases on, uh, on the anterior approach. So I, I do a large incision uh, from the ASIS to the lateral border of the patella. I even wrote here large incision. Um, and, and the reason is I'd like to, again, obtain an anatomic reduction. I'd like to be able to see the fracture, manipulate the fracture and clamp the fracture and, and ensure that the fracture is uh, maintained, uh, stably compressed before the final implants go in. I protect the lateral uh, cutaneous femoral nerve. Uh, there's other approaches that are a little bit more lateral that avoid the nerve, which you can obviously use. Uh, modifications of the Smith-Peterson. Uh, I go through the sartorius and uh, tensor fascia lata, and then I find the large uh, direct head of the rectus. I still tenotomize the rectus from the AIIS, and um, 
And then you sometimes see this iliocapsularis, which I clear, I try to clear uh, sharply to avoid any HO postoperatively and uh, identify the capsule, confirm um, at the right location and perform the capsulotomy. So here's uh, from uh, one of the cases and I'll typically, um, you know, be able to see the capsule, but not necessarily sure where the, the um, femoral neck is on fluoro. So I usually typically put a, a K wire in before performing the capsulotomy. And then I can really perform the capsulotomy at the mid cervical um, a point in the femoral neck and uh, get the right trajectory of the capsulotomy. And depending on if I'm doing a, you know, basi cervical, transcervical, or subcapital versus a femoral head, I'll either T-shape it uh, along the labral margin or, or do a T-shape at the basal cervical region. <clears throat> so here's um, just a, a video that I wanted to show about the case. So here's, it's a fairly uh, large incision, but, but deep, deep uh, the muscles are well uh, protected. So there's a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. It's, it's double speed. So apologize that it appears a little fast. Blunt dissection, identifying the uh, TFL and sartorius. And then you will see a very large, uh, big uh, muscle, which really helps with the uh, landmark uh, of the incision. So that's your rectus exposure. I isolate the rectus and free it. And I do tenotomize it uh, off the AIAS. If it's really a basic cervical fracture and I retract it medially and it does not uh, uh, ruin the exposure, then I will not uh, tenotomize it. But I have to tell you, I frequently tenotomize it and repair it uh, with a number one vicral. So there's the reflection of the uh, rectus. It's being tagged and uh, deep. You'll find your uh, circumflex vessels, which um, again, it, you know, seemingly are a little distal, but if you need to work and reduce the femoral neck, uh, these invariably have to be uh, ligated to expose uh, the inferior calcar area uh, down to um, especially the inner trochanteric region to get clamps on and, and to, to see the reduction uh, properly. So here we're just ligating the uh, circumflex vessels. Just showing you that it actually is a, a an artery. <clears throat> so here we're, we're working, we're working the capsule, trying to get off the soft tissues, illocapsularis, and trying to get a very good uh, capsular exposure uh, with a cob and or sponges. Really trying to get a nice. So there's there's my typical capsular exposure. Uh, just before, and you can see how, you know, you really don't know where you're going sometimes. So we'll put a K wire uh, into the femoral neck, and then I'll, I'll uh, make sure I know where the trajectory is. This was a, obviously a fairly new fracture. So you can see the fracture hematoma. There's actually some very good questions about uh, evacuating hematomas in closed reductions. And then I'll basically just continue the capsulotomy uh, along the neck and then do a T-shape or H-shape capsulotomy and tag the margins. Obviously, when you're going cranially, you want to make sure you avoid the labrum. So I take a look where the labrum is and then I'll stop uh, just before. So obviously, this is just the vertical limb. The uh, T or H-shape has not been performed. And that's the incision at the uh, end of the case. Uh, so these clamps, usually on all my femoral neck reductions, and again, you can see they're, they're eccentrically located in the anterior femoral neck. So um, they're put in through 2.5 millimeter drill holes, and they can help reduce that an apex anterior deformity and um, obtain compression at the fracture margin. And I will seek out, you know, John mentioned this, I will seek out uh, reductions and ensure that there's actual anatomic cortical interdigitation. And I'm usually getting even, uh, you know, magged or 
physically looking at, but I'm making sure these, the calcar uh, segments, and sometimes there's a cranial read just to make sure those are reduced anatomically. Then I'll, I'll um, put my uh, K wires in for cannulated screws or if I'm using a sliding hip screw. So this is that patient that I showed uh, initially. And uh, here's the patient at 12 months um, uh, post-op and healed uh, their femoral neck. Reflections, a lesson learned. I think what works for me typically is a large open approach that allows me uh, direct visualization, direct reduction techniques and anatomic reduction. Uh, what could be done differently? I would consider trying close treatment, but I'm, uh, I'm a little anxious, honestly, to, to not be able to do it, uh, to do it adequately. Uh, but I think there is a role for close reduction if, if technically um, you're able to. So thank you guys very much and uh, feel free to answer some questions. Thanks, Mitch. Um, just while I'm getting the screen share, can you just go again over there? There's been a lot of questions about the blood supply to the femoral head and why are you taking down part of the circumflex vessels? Can you just uh, just kind of go over your thoughts about that and, and kind of explain so that for that approach? We're, we're taking down the lateral femoral circumflex, um, which come across uh, uh, anteriorly. That that is, I believe, I'm not a microvascular surgeon, but I believe those are the vessels if you need to do a free fibula, uh, they'll typically dock into those vessels, but those vessels have not been shown to be the main blood supply to the, to the femoral head. Yeah. So what I don't do is obviously go cranial and posteriorly uh, around to uh, where the medial uh, femoral circumflex enters the capsule. And then um, there are also some questions about besides the Smith Peterson approach, um, like what do you and John, please jump in as well. Like, do you feel like there's any utility for the Watson Jones or there is some cadaveric studies that looked at access um, about that. So what are your thoughts about different approaches? Actually, you mentioned I just did it. a Watson Jones actually two weeks ago it was my first ever. Uh, it was it was honestly a real a real basy cervical uh, inner trochanteric flavor to it. It worked extremely well, actually. But I feel that if, if it's subcapital or transcervical, at least in my hands, I can see and touch and manipulate the fracture uh, better with an anterior approach. But um, the Watson Joan, again, it depends on your experience. If you can see, manipulate, I think it could work. It's also a very large incision, um, but it's, it would work for that fracture type. Yeah, I think in, in my experiences, especially in larger patients, um, working through a Watson Jones with a lot of anterior musculature and soft tissue kind of draping down into the surgical field can be challenging sometimes. I think the other thing that uh, I've gained is that the, the clamps and the instrumentation that I like to use to reduce these, you saw some use of modified uh, pointed tenaculums, uh, tenaculums that will, uh, can be placed around the lateral aspect of the proximal femur to key in the inferior aspect of the neck are more easily in my hands placed uh, from an anterior to posterior direction through an anterior approach versus coming kind of over the top and, and placing that retractor into the uh, into the surgical field. So while it does require a separate surgical incision or percutaneous incisions, if you're just going to be using cannulated screws, um, I do favor an anterior approach over a uh, Watson Jones kind of anterior lateral approach. I think for me, really basal cervical fractures are the ones um, that get it. Um, and the, I mean, like you mentioned, you know, one of the benefits is that you can do the implants through the same exposure, um, but it can be more difficult, uh, like if you want to do any accessory type implants uh, as compared to more direct into your approach. Um, there are a couple questions that kind of deal with, you know, are there downsides to open reductions? And then it was brought up about uh, Morshed's paper about um, closed reductions doing better than open reductions. How about some thoughts about What's the, what's the cost of doing the open reduction? Like, why shouldn't you do it? Like John had a, John had a, I think a very 
reasonable case to say, yeah, that, that's a bad idea to do an open reduction if you're doing it at a separate time as the vascular repair when the guy's already lost 40 units. So like that seems very reasonable if you can get the closed reduction good, like do it. But in, in like a normal kind of closed fracture, uh, PALS 3, like why shouldn't I do an open reduction? What's the cost of that? You know, not not to get like into the literature and and the fragility of literature and and you know. That's why we're here. Really, it's a fireside. Okay, so we're okay. We're getting we're getting we're getting we're getting hot. We're getting hot. Okay, we're yeah. doing we're doing it. I really think it, you 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 have to look at your skill set, what you're comfortable with, and what you're good at. Uh, to be honest with you, these fractures, in my humble opinion, are unforgiving. You know the the revision surgeries can be extremely uh, morbid, especially if you're now looking at a salvage type procedure, which I believe is an arthroplasty uh, as opposed to the patient's native hip. So if you can obtain a closed reduction that is stable and that is compressed and the calcar is not translated, I think closed reduction is always better than an open reduction. I, I you know if you can get the same reduction closed than open closed should be better. But in my hands and the way I was taught, I cannot do that. I cannot do that. I can do that open and I'm very confident doing it open. And I, I feel like I get an anatomic reduction open. Yeah, I think, is, yeah, I think there is a lot of the literature is, uh, is challenged by you know those folks who are doing it and what's been judged as acceptable. A lot of these don't have, you know, any sort of uh, CT or other radiographic uh, evaluation of, of how well the reduction was performed. Like I said, or like I think Mitch said, you know, these fractures are very unforgiving. And so I think if you can obtain uh, a good closed reduction, I mean, a, a closed reduction without any insult to the biology is, is more favorable than, than an open reduction. But I think we've all had the experience of even with an open reduction and, and even with clamps or guide wires or um, anti-rotation screws in place, still seeing a rotational malreduction or still seeing your anatomic reduction lost with implant placement in a very young patient, especially in very good bone quality. And so uh, I'm hoping that, you know, there's a lot of uh, folks who have already chimed in, or I think are, you know, will be or, or have already contributed to some of the literature. There's gonna be literature coming out. I think of some, you know, a couple of larger series that uh, continue to provide uh, data uh, on this topic. I think it's, you know, it continues to evolve, but right now, you know, either valgus intertrochanteric osteotomy or conversion to a, an arthroplasty uh, is not benign. And uh, especially if the patient ends up, you know, uh, having AVN, there's really no, you know, there's not a great role with advanced AVN for, a valgus osteotomy type procedure to save a young person's hip. So um, I think the pendulum is definitely swinging. You know, we had mentioned this in our, in the talks that we had before this, when I came out of, uh, you know, fellowship, I guess, nine years ago now, I, I almost thought that closed reduction was heresy. That's, that wasn't even a thing. Like that was something that we talked about and read about in, you know, the literature and, Campbell's. Textbooks. and now I think the pendulum is very much swinging back. And I think we continue to see, well done close reductions with stable fixation and uh and it works it definitely it definitely works uh, i just think there's attention still has to be paid to the quality of the reduction and so it can't be a it can't be a caca reduction it has to be a, a near anatomic reduction and uh application of stable fixation and i think uh, a lot of these hips will do well yeah, I think that, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that we have to be honest with ourselves and be ready to do the open reduction if we can't get it closed. And so some of the literature I would say may have some selection bias inherently with the ones that show closed reductions do better. They're, the ones that you do open reductions are typically gonna be, whether it's a PALS two or three, every PALS two or three isn't the same PALS two and three. And so you usually, the ones that get the open reduction, if you're going to start with close, they're going to be the harder fracture. So they're going to be likely have the worst outcome based on injury pattern, including posture comminution. And so sometimes we do close reductions in the ones that are most comminuted, like John, we've talked about it before. And that's one of the potential reasons for doing 
a close reduction, but it's still getting the reduction. So um, that, that I would say we've said it a bazillion times and you've heard it out of other, other uh, presentations, but getting the reduction is key. And so you have to be familiar with the radiographic parameters for a good reduction. Uh, and be comfortable with knowing that your first try at getting this right is the best chance of that person doing well, because they are not forgiving, for sure. There's um, there's a lot of implant questions, and so I think we'll save that those until the discussion part after John's uh, biomechanical uh, talk. And then the, the number of questions are awesome. We're over like about 50, almost 60 questions. Um, and so that's great. That's why we want you to kind of keep asking them. Um, one of the things just uh, to, to get from an indication standpoint, so there's a question about if somebody presents greater than 72 hours after injury, does it change whether you try uh, open or closed reduction? Like, does that factor into your decision-making process? No. I think, I think it does. I think there is, I will have a lower threshold to convert to um, open in a, a hip capsule that's been bled into for, for three days and potentially, you know, uh, potentially, you know, uh, you're not, you're not going to move to an arthroplasty is what the way I read that question. No, okay. no, no, definitely yeah. not. no, it was, it was more of it how you're more gonna, close. Just, more of how you're going to reduce it. Like, are you going okay. to try a closed reduction if they present late? Basically it's how I took the question. Yeah. I don't think there's any downside to, to trying, right. There's no, that like, you don't burn any bridges with, a few attempts. I just think that um, when these shorten, I think it's it's harder to obtain that that reduction that you want. I think it's easier in the acute setting. The other thing is that you know that hip is already at risk, and so I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that reduction, at least for me in a situation like that, that reduction is as close to anatomic as possible to give that hip the best chance at surviving. Because if, if anything's a little bit off, knowing that the blood supply may already have uh, been injured, I don't want to take anything less than a, a near anatomic reduction or anatomic reduction uh, for fixation. And then uh, there's some questions about, maybe Mitch can comment, do you ever, when you're doing an open reduction, do you ever uh, bone graft acutely? Uh, yes. Um, though where there's, where there's no or very little cortical interdigitation i mean john john uh showed a, a good example of that where it's a you know a ballistic injury um i've had i've had bone grafting in the femoral neck it's been bone graft substitute i've not used uh structural autograft but um a colleague of mine actually did with uh it was an adolescent with a large bone cyst that uh that needed a uh structural autograft so, I mean, you know, the, the, the indications are there. Um, but you're not doing it routinely for comminuted? No, because ru routinely, even, even the highly comminuted ones, typically there's a anterior cranial read. And so when it's, when it's uh, reduced, the, the fractures shut down, you know, there's no even room to, to put it in. You're getting, you're getting, you're getting very st stable uh, cortical, um compression uh, you know it's a different example if you have a circumferential comminution with with bone loss i mean that's very different and then another kind of related question is do you ever compromise length of the fracture to get cortical contact like say it is comminuted do you ever just say well this neck's going to shorten anyway let me get it to where i can compress it i have not encountered that situation um the even the you know in Montreal we don't have much ballistics but when, when I was in Chicago we definitely had our fair share I, even with that I did, did not have that situation where it was circumferentially uh, gone the bone John I have and it was another the one that comes to mind specifically was another ballistic ballistic injury um, and I did sacrifice length for valgus uh, positioning and. Uh, she still went out to fail. So I don't know if I did something wrong, uh, but I have, um, I think it, it can happen, especially in some of the higher energy in, uh, injuries when, you know, maybe it's a little bit more of a combined uh, mechanism and not just, you know, uh, axial load up the femur. 
Uh, but if you have something that you know, impacts the hip from the lateral side as well, it can get some uh, uh, mid cervical crush. Uh, let's see. The other uh, one that we haven't really addressed is what about when do you advance weight bearing in these patients, and what what's your initial post operative protocol, and then when do you advance weight bearing if they're not weight bearing is tolerated right away? John. Yeah. So for me, flat foot weight bearing uh, immediately for six weeks, uh, and then just if the fracture is you know, otherwise. Uh, healthy individual at six weeks, I'll start partial progressive from six weeks to 12 weeks uh, for full activity at, uh, at three months. If there's anything that I'm concerned about, I'll keep him flat foot or, or toe touch for uh, between weeks six and 12. And that's my general protocol. I don't let any of these folks weight bear immediately right after surgery. Some of them do uh, on their own, but that is not uh, prescribed by me. Yes, some of them do on their own. I do 12 weeks. Uh touchdown weight bearing the weight of the leg on the floor and try not to do any open chain uh exercises i've gotten uh more aggressive i do foot flat weight bearing for the first six weeks and then let them weight bear as tolerated um i used to go 12 weeks but have changed and haven't you know i don't have data to back it up but i haven't noticed a significant change in failure um, the last uh, thing that I want to talk about or ask or get a question answered before we move on to the next section is there's been a lot of question about uh, capsulotomy and intracapsular hematoma. Um, and we kind of mentioned it a little bit with close reduction. Uh, I don't think uh, either of you said that you routinely release the capsule if you're going to do a close reduction. Obviously, you're going to open it with an open, but there were some questions about like if they're delayed presentation, is that more likely if you're going to do a closed reduction, are you going to do a uh, capsulotomy? Uh, any different thoughts about it? Just it's, a, it's like four or five questions about it. So I just want to make sure we hit it home. I don't, I don't have, I really have no experience with that, to be honest. I mean, in the pediatric literature, where some of my practices with, with skiffies, that standard of care now is, is doing a capsulotomy. Um, that's the only thing I can comment. Yeah, as I mentioned before, it's not something that I re routinely do. I think following an open reduction, I'll close capsule. It's not, it's never a, a watertight closure, um, but I do not routinely percutaneously release uh, the capsule with a 15 blade or, or similar. Um, on a breath, what do you think on this? Yeah, I think the, like I, I, I close capsule uh, loosely as well with open reductions. Um, and then the, uh, like, if you think about if they're really a truly high energy neck injury in a young patient, the capsule is going to be torn, usually posteriorly, especially if they have posterior comminution. And so it is something that you can kind of look at on the CT scan. Um, or there are some people that are getting MRIs for these before, like if they have an associated femoral shaft fracture. And so if it's not really displaced um, and you're worried about it, then I don't think there's data that says that it's bad to do it. There's definitely, as far as I know, in adults, no literature that supports routinely doing it. And so, I, and that's the best that we have right now. So there may be something down the road that says different, but I think at least for an adult, there's no data that would say you have to do it. Uh, but if you see a bunch of hematoma and the capsule's intact on the CT scan, then that's one where I would do it if I was thought I would do a closed reduction. Um, with that, we'll move on to the um, biomechanics component and we'll try to get all of the um, like fixation questions that were asked uh, at that time, okay? So th again, thanks for asking all these really good questions. And we'll move on to John's uh, article presentation. John, you're mute. Yeah, sorry, Classic. you're muted. Classic. <laughs> Zoom. Zoom fail after what, 16 months? <laughs> no. All right, so uh, we're gonna go through this really quickly. Um, this is a biomechanics paper that we had, had done looking at some of the fracture components that have been identified. And you know, we talk a lot about posterior inferior comminution, the vertical orientation of these fractures. And so uh, the goal of this study was to identify the uh, contribution of axial obliquity and posterior inferior uh, comminution on femoral neck fracture fixation. This really came from Corey Collins' paper, CT paper, that looked at how common uh, 
the axial uh, uh, orientation, or the axial uh, angle was, and as well as the uh, how common the inferior comminution was on uh, these with these fractures. And so we use fourth gen saw bones uh, with different simulated fracture morphologies using both cannulated screws or sliding hip screw to evaluate um, uh, and evaluate these using a torsional testing protocol, which is a little bit different than what's commonly done. And you know, if you think about a lot of the biomechanical literature that you uh, most likely read, these have been tested with some sort of you know, axial load. The proximal femur is potted, and then there's some load applied from the cranial aspect of the femoral head. But we know that this hip sees a little bit more complex uh, loads, and especially as the hip is in flexion, there's an extension, the quadriceps uh, and the hip flexors are activated, that there is a torsional load that it's, that's placed on these. And um, we wanted to see if that posterior inferior comminution affected uh, fracture fixation. So we tested, we made a custom jig that we uh, were able to mount to the, the proximal femur. And so we had four groups. Uh, one was uh, those fractures that had a, a coronal angulation or an osteotomy made in the coronal plane only. Then uh, those that had that coronal plane uh, osteotomy made with an axial obliquity uh, made it 24 degrees as seen there, which is the common obliquity which is seen with these fractures. And then we uh, had two additional groups, one uh, coronal plane with posterior inferior comminution. And then the last group, which kind of uh, put everything together and had the coronal plane with the axial obliquity and posterior inferior comminution. The mounting setup that we had was had axial preload to it. And so the, um, while the custom jig is on the top left of your screen, on the bottom right of your screen is the, the jig that we used and it was preloaded. Um, uh, and then the instrument was placed uh, distally and then rotated the distal aspect of the femur to create kind of a torsional load on the proximal femur. And this would place the, uh, the specimens uh, at a, the greatest disadvantage, right? Axial, a um, little bit of axial load, but then with the uh, with the axial obliquity as well as the posterior inferior comminution, kind of really turning the femur into that uh, area where there was a, a gap. And so, if you look here at the, we have two graphs that we included in the paper, and I think summarize the uh, the findings pretty nicely. And so, if you look at torque to failure by fracture morphology. The four groups that we had explained uh, on the previous slide are, are seen on the right-hand uh, image there. And so the, uh, the coronal uh, plane, the axial plane alone, um, then with the, the inferior comminution. Uh, and the takeaway here is that while the axial obliquity uh, did decrease, both with the sliding hip screw and the cannulated screws, um, the strength of the, the construct, once you added in posterior inferior comminution, uh, that was kind of like the great equalizer. And so with both implants, both the sliding hip screw as well as the cannulated uh, screws alone, uh, once that posterior inferior comminution was uh, placed into the system, uh, neither uh, or the axial obliquity really wasn't as much of a, of a factor as it was seen uh, between the first two groups. And then uh, again, if you just take that same data and then kind of do head to head comparisons, interestingly enough, as compared to a lot of other the, the other biomechanical studies that have been uh, put out there that just looked at axial loading the cannulated screws actually perform better than the uh, sliding hip screw and anti-rotation screw uh, in each of these uh, in each of these groups. And so, the uh, cannulated screws we hypothesized, you know, place three points of peripheral fixation in a you know in a fourth gen sawbone, which is an otherwise you know otherwise supposed to represent a a well a healthy uh, young individual with good bone versus two more centrally placed implants, uh, and that being a uh, the barrel and screw of a, a sliding hip screw as well as an anti-rotation screw. And so you have two points of more central fixation versus three points of peripheral fixation. And the three points of peripheral fixation, at least in this study, uh, performed uh, better, at least in terms of deformation with a torsional load. And so I, I think this is uh, provide some insight into um, the behavior of these fractures and recognizing that, you know, we see failures with uh, sliding hip screws, we see failures with uh, cannulated screws alone, but understanding, you know, we make a big deal about this posterior inferior comminution and, and how that, uh, you know, potentially plays into the failure of these uh, fractures with, with regard to uh, fixation. But 
uh, there is something to be said for uh, both fracture fixation as well as, as the implant use. And so maybe this is why some of the newer implants that are uh, have come out onto the market, which combine the benefits of a fixed angle device as well as multiple points of uh, more peripheral fixation uh, have a role in uh, these fractures. And so, you know, it'd be kind of interesting to open open the discussion up to the, the you know, the other panelists to see if they've had any experience with these. I have, um, and, you know, I don't think there's any large series that have, um, that have been put out, but there are definitely newer implants that I think a lot of us are seeing out there um, uh, that may provide some benefits with these, you know, understanding that all things created equal with a, with a you know, near anatomic reduction, you know, what else can we do that's in our, uh, you know, that's based on, you know, our decision-making, uh, you know, to improve the care of these, uh, these fractures. So I think that's it from my standpoint, I'll stop sharing and then we can uh, continue on. Thanks, John. I think that's a great segue into the, a lot of the questions about um, implant selection. And so why don't we do that? Uh, I think uh, Mitch, you had uh, just answered maybe a question about when to do a sliding hip screw versus cannulated screws. And I think there, you know, there are a lot of uh, articles that out there that we could have gone over from a clinical standpoint. We thought, um, you know, the main purpose of the fireside is to go over um, kind of interesting cases as well as techniques that people have, but then also try to add a little bit of a journal club uh, part to it um, and uh, get get like a specific article that may be like. I was surprised to read John's article and find that the cannulated screws did better in a part because that that didn't really um, like at least in some subgroups that didn't play out for the faith trial, which isn't exactly this population, but there are more articles for young femoral neck fractures that are going to come out um, like there's a group that I, I we submitted uh, patients to that Corey College was the primary author that got presented at the OTA. There's the Morshed paper. There's other articles coming out with large patient volumes or numbers that are maybe gonna help decide some of these questions. And it's gonna be hard to do a prospective trial on these patients uh, because they aren't very common. Um, but why don't we just kind of spend the rest of the, about five to 10 minutes on um, wrapping up with some of the implant questions. So. We did for a, a time, and there there's a couple of people that asked this, like, what role do you guys uh, have for the uh, medial calcar plate, uh, whether for reduction, whether for an anti-glide purpose? Like, tell me the role that you guys use this implant, and where is the best place to put it? So, so there's two types in my in my experience. There's the there's the calcar plate that you put on after you stabilize your fixation, meaning you have to externally rotate and I always put the leg in, uh, you can flex externally rotate to get access to the true medial inferior calcar or um, where I more commonly use it is after the reduction is obtained with clamps, if there's an anterior inferior a fracture line that's amenable to like an anti-glide type of construct, I'll put uh, like a small fragment DC plate on. So that, I think that's the caveat number one. And number two is you really need um, good exposure down the calcar towards the lesser trochanter to get that, um, to get that plate on. So I typically use it um, more to obtain and maintain the reduction and um, where there's a fractional line anteriorly or inferiorly that just uh, like shuts it down while I put my definitive fixation in. I, I have not really done a larger 3-5 type plate, um, like flexed, externally rotated, like really up in there. Can you say up in there on this uh, fireside? It's too late now. I said it. Yeah. I hope this is not recorded. All right, John, okay. how about... <laughs> If you can describe it in more, uh, you know, PG terms, go go ahead. Anything anything goes in Canada, so it's you know, it's uh, no censorship there. Um, I have not been a, a frequent user of any of the either anterior or um, medial plates, and I think my experience was 
uh, was a little bit jaded by a few valgus and trochan osteotomies that I had to do early in my career where I had to go dig some of those plates back out from an anterior approach and then go back to the lateral approach to do my my valgus osteotomy because either the, their screws are broken or they're in a, a suboptimal position and wouldn't allow me to pass, pass my blade. Now that's not always the case, but um, you know, I think you know, in addition to a lot of other surgeries, I, I always I do think about what if I have to go back and, and dig this out, or what if this patient gets converted to a, um, a, a total hip or something like that, you know, something like that. Uh, so I have not used, I, I maybe have used it once, um, but it's just not something that's, that's in my, you know, that I'm doing frequently. I think there is, there's a little bit of biomechanical literature uh, out on there, out on this topic. And, you know, the, the really interesting thing is when you look at the clinical images of uh, this plate and its placement in patients, it doesn't really match the placement and the screw position of the implants that were placed in the biomechanical studies that are that are out there. They, you know, the one that I'm thinking of has a reconstruction style plate that courses down all along the anterior medial aspect of the medial aspect of the of the femur with the tip of the plate almost, you know, at or past the articular surface of the inferior portion of the head with large, almost bicortical three, five screws splayed out in a very, you know, I don't know, just a fashion that I haven't commonly seen uh, ever in people's images uh, who do this plate you know, frequently. So I think there's, I'm not saying that that invalidates the, the study, but, you know, if we're gonna be using, um, biomechanical literature to help guide our, our implant selection, uh, I think we do need to kind of match what's done clinically with what's done uh, in the lab. I do think, you know, sometimes it means being placed a little bit more anteriorly than medial, uh, depending on the fracture exit point. And that's been kind of one uh, time where I've used um, a small fragment plate, but the, like, it, you're totally right. Like the thing that I kind of stress about is, well, if this isn't going to work, like I've now I've got to go through this again to get it out when I know I have to do an intertroche osteotomy. And so like, it's not that you should just doom them to having more surgery, but you also have to think about, like you said, John, like what's, what's next and will this compromise their outcome? And so there've been a number of questions about like uh, biplanar or non-parallel screw fixation. Do you guys try to do parallel screws when you're using them, or do you try to do off-axis screws um, when you're using cannulated screws? I, I mean, go for... Yeah. Go ahead, Mitch. I, I, go for, I, I go for parallel, and of course, it depends on how the, the C-arm is, is positioned, so it's parallel, and then all of a sudden, you get a new C-arm tech, and... It's like a slightly different view and you're like, oh, it's not parallel. So I do parallel on the AP and I really try to stick to the periphery on the lateral. And sometimes if my entry point is not separated on the lateral, at least I'll send the trajectory almost like a bouquet along, as long as I can get uh, peripheral uh, neck uh, at the calcar region. But, uh, but I do try to go parallel on the AP. John? Yeah, similar. I guess the one exception is instead of using more of a um, Powell's type screw, which actually uh, goes through the, the cortex of the inferior aspect of the neck. And like you'd mentioned before, almost in a lag fashion to, to pull that inferior neck in and key that read in. I have used a, a more inferiorly uh, oriented or a transversely oriented inferior screw in addition to, you know, two or three screws. I've also used you know, I know in, in Europe, there's a lot of places that will just use two screws for fixation. Um, if the patient can accommodate it, um, I like, or I have placed four very peripheral screws. Uh, I think the placement again is, is, is critical here. And so not having a, not having a cluster of centrally placed screws, even in a young patient, um, you know, I think that's, you know, if we talked about maybe one of the things in addition to the axial load, the torsional load that that occurs, you know, centrally placed implants may be at a disadvantage as, as, um, as opposed to peripherally placed screws. Uh, you know, we talk about it sometimes in the older patients, but I think it's important in the younger patient as well.
Yeah, the, the biomechanical paper, I think it was in the late 90s out of Europe where they just did two screws. The critical part was not necessarily that anterior superior screw, but that the posterior inferior and posterior superior within three millimeters of so the cortex. And that was in, you know, that's not necessarily always applicable for younger patients, but I think you should still try to get peripheral. Um, and then you, John mentioned a little bit about um, other implants and the last question that's hanging out there is about uh, newer implants like um, there's the uh, femoral neck system. And so the, just to kind of wrap up, we're kind of short on time, but you know, young femoral neck fractures, this is that 28 year old comminuted fracture, widely displaced. There's the recon showing anterior and posterior um, imaging through with a 3D CT. And so this is a complex fracture. It's high vertical uh, or high, vertically oriented. So this is uh, open reduction for me. The, there's two wires for joysticks, multiple wires to maintain the reduction, including um, uh, placing, a, it's not an anti-rotation wire for this particular application. It's a compression screw. So usually, except maybe in ballistic type injuries, you can usually find a compressible surface and it's usually cranially. And so this is a cranial screw compressing the fracture. Um, and then blade plates do still exist. And so those are important to remember. And if you uh, have that screw first and leave your multiple wires in there, um, you can implant a blade plate without displacing your fracture. Um, so it's not something, you know, if you're not ever, if you've never put one in, then I wouldn't like jump at it at this fracture for your first one, but it's an implant that's still, um, usable. And then I still, uh, I have used the newer implants and this is the femoral neck system with uh, off screw trajectory, basically like screw and screw to try to minimize rotational instability, as well as limit uh, compression with a, a blunt tipped um, uh, blade type uh, implant as far as the main um, sliding implant, but it limits the amount of slide that can happen. But I still think it's important to compress it initially. So for me, um, using that screw cranially is important. And there, there's not really, um, you know, there's some studies that are going to come out with smaller series. There's a Japanese series that I don't think has been published yet in um, geriatric patients. And the failure rate, at least the data that I saw, was 11%. So that's a lot lower than what's out there currently for displaced geriatric garden three and four fractures because arthroplasty is not. Uh, seen as a, a great option in Japan for some reason, but um, will there be more data coming out, but we'll see like everything that's come out, uh, the fracture still will slide around like that um, blade plates, they can still slide on the blade plate. Um, so if fractures want to compress, they will compress. Uh, we haven't found the ideal implant, um, but this recording is going to be available. You'll get a link um, with the Zoom um, uh, recording link as well as the opportunity to, to get your CME and then this uh, recording will also be on the AO Trauma North America YouTube channel. There's a lot of content on there. We've gotten over a million hits in the last about year on YouTube AO Trauma North America channel. So a lot of content on there. Please visit um, our take homes for this uh, fireside. Uh, open and closed reduction have roles and so you have to figure out for you where that fits, but the reduction is key. Fracture configuration and fixation strategies do matter. So, um, you know, if you have posterior comminution, you wanna have something that would be more length stable, uh, potentially to try to minimize uh, collapse. Uh, and then uh, John's paper also talked about the biomechanics of fracture configuration and, and the difference between sliding hip screw uh, with an anti-rotation screw and cannulated screws but it comes down to reduction. So really kind of figure out how you can get your best reduction, whether that's closed or open, or maybe it means somebody else does it. So I think we ha always have to be honest with ourselves. Like, are we the best person for the job? Um, in the upcoming sessions, there's a lot of great content coming up. Um, next week is uh, for I am nailing of the thermal shaft and avoiding common pitfalls, including malrotation. And then you'll see there are some dates uh, around like Memorial Day and um, Fourth of July that there there won't be stuff, but there, there are also some conflicting kind of courses going on. So it's not every week, but it's pretty consistent through the end of July.
So please come back and join us. Um, they'll, you'll get links and uh, requests to sign up for the firesides. We really appreciate everybody's attention and uh, thanks for making it interactive. It's awesome when we get questions. So keep asking hard questions and uh, we'll see you next time. We do have a couple of evaluation questions. So please respond um, and then we'll let you guys uh, get out of here.